World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars. About 20 million people were killed. And soon after the war, um, World War II began, which claimed 60 million lives. In December 25, 1967, a little over 50 years ago, U.S. News and World Report wrote, Since World War II, there have been at least 12 limited wars in the world, 39 political assassinations, 48 personal revolts, 74 rebellions for independence, 162 social revolutions, either political, economic, racial, or religious. And obviously, as we think about that, that was 1967. That was 51 years ago. And since then, there's even been more. We've seen war between Russia and Afghanistan and China and Vietnam, Vietnam and Cambodia, wars between Iraq and Iran and Iraq and Kuwait and Bosnia, as well as a number of regional conflicts, Northern Ireland, South Africa, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, Grenada, India, Panama, Somalia, Haiti, Kosovo, Colombia, and Afghanistan, just to name a few. If you think about it, our own country is its own conflicts and difficulties, whether it be racial tensions or rising crime rates or gang wars or random violence and terrorism and an increasing moral degeneracy. So how do you respond to those kinds of things? How do you respond to the turmoil and the chaos that you see and hear about in our world? I, I think some people choose to ignore it. They don't watch the news. They don't want to hear about it. Other people get angry. Uh, some people worry and they have a hard time sleeping at night. Others decide to be a little more proactive and get involved in a cause or Maybe some of us just eat more chocolate. A wife once asked her husband, do you want to watch the 6 o'clock news and get indigestion or watch the 10 o'clock news and have insomnia? And in the midst of this, we as Christians have to ask ourselves, where is God in the midst of all this conflict? Uh, of all these disasters and terrible things that are going on, disease and heartache, where is God in the midst of this? And David in Psalm 2 addresses the problem of a world that's seemingly out of control. And he confidently concludes, I want to give you the main idea right up front so you don't miss it. That though there are many in rebellion against God, he's still in control as the sovereign king. Therefore, we must submit to him while there is still time. Let me repeat that. Though many are in rebellion against God, he's still in control as our sovereign king. Therefore, we must submit to him while there is still time. Last week, we started a series in the book of Psalms. We're going to be looking at, at several as we conclude this summer. And uh, Psalm 2 is one that I've never preached on and never taught, but it's an important psalm. And if you remember, last week we looked at Psalm 1. And in Psalm 1, it begins with the word, Blessed. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, etc., etc. And at the end of Psalm 2, it says, Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Psalm 2 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. Psalm 1 contrasts the righteous and the wicked person. Psalm 2 contrasts the rebellion of wicked nations against the rule of the righteous Messiah. Uh, psalm 1, some people say, is really a, a wisdom psalm. Because it's giving us counsel and it's teaching us something for our own personal lives. And so perhaps it represents the Old Testament law. While Psalm 2 is what we might call a royal psalm. And it represents the Old Testament prophets because it speaks of the coming Messiah. And so why don't we jump in and, and look at what God wants to teach us in this psalm. And it begins by just kind of explaining what's going on in David's day as well as in our day. That... There's resistance against God's rule. Psalm 2, verses 1 to 3. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The context here is the nations were rallying against Israel and David, her king. And there's even a broader meaning here referring to God's anointed, who is the promised descendant of David. 
Jesus Christ. I don't know if you knew it, but Christ isn't his last name. Did you know that? That Christ actually is a title. And Christ is a Greek word which means anointed one. And we also use the term Messiah in the Hebrew, Messiah. And so in Israel's history, there were prophets, priests, and especially kings that were anointed, signifying that they were chosen by God for that position. And so they were anointed ones. And so this, uh, this term would, would resound with an Israelite, knowing that we're talking about someone that's divinely appointed by God. And we'll see later that it's not just referring to David and the kings that followed him, but ultimately the one through who went through David's line, Jesus, the Christ, or the Anointed One. Uh, another thought here that I think is helpful in background to understand is that Satan is behind every rebellion against God. As you, as you look at these first three verses, you see a lot of anger, you see a lot of turmoil, you see conspiring, and you see um, rebellion. And it's interesting to note that spiritually Satan is behind every rebellion against God. In fact, the original rebellion in heaven was Satan and a third of the angels who became his fallen angels. And it's described in Isaiah 14. It says, Shining morning star, how you have fallen from the heavens. You destroyer of nations, you have been cut down to the ground. You say to yourself, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set up my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the God's assembly in the remotest parts of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will make myself like the most high. You know, today when we look at the troubles in the world, when we look at the conflicts and the wars and the hardship and a lot of those things going on, sometimes I think we lose sight of the fact that there's a spiritual war going on, that, that there's something behind the scenes. I mean, what we look at is we see conflicts between nations and we wonder, you know, oh my goodness, can't we just have a peace treaty? Well, there's something stronger going on. There, there's a, a conflict that goes way beyond the physical characters that are playing it out, that Satan's involved inspiring this rebellion against God and this conflict among people. And as we look through the Old Testament, we see that in a number of places. Adam and Eve's fall, or Satan used the serpent to, to tempt them. We see the Tower of Babel where they rebelled against God and, and said they were going to be great and elevate mankind above God. We see the nations who warred with Israel throughout the Old Testament. As we move to the New Testament, we see Satan's hand behind the religious leaders that opposed Jesus and later persecuted the early church. And we see that today even, the persecution of Christians all over the world. Sometimes we don't hear it in the news, but there are more Christians being persecuted today than any other time in human history. At the end times, we'll see a rebellion by the Antichrist and the false prophet. And even after Christ comes to return at the end of his millennial kingdom, we'll see Satan having a final rebellion. But it tells us here that it's all in vain. The nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain that this is something that will fail. That this is something that we don't need to lose sleep over that what's going to happen is evil going to overtake the entire world and is everything righteous and holy going to be destroyed and ruined? No, God says, I've got it all under control. I know what's going to happen. That all of this plotting, all of this conflict, all of this rebellion, it's in vain. They plot in vain. And today there's all kinds of forms of rebellion against God. The denial of the existence of God in the public arena, in public schools, the, the rise of secularism, which is almost a religion in and of itself. The idea that there is no God, or that we live that way. There's cults and false religions that reject the true God for their own gods. There's our ungodly culture that promotes an immoral lifestyle and practices that go against God's plan for us. There's legal opposition against the church. It seems like I hear about it every day. I get an email about something that's happening where the rights of believers are being taken away, or there's opposition to the Christian faith, or at least spreading it. Uh, there's literal persecution of Christians 
even in our country today. And then also there's some of the ones that maybe we don't even identify with a rebellion from Satan, but it is the rejection of the sanctity of human life and a rejection of the biblical view of marriage and the family and gender and morality. All those things are evidences that this that is being described in Psalm 2 is continuing to happen. And I think most of us are aware of it. And for us, I think there's an important point to make just looking at these first three verses that in application, when we follow our old nature, we rebel against God's authority to rule over us. But when we submit to him, we find his peace, his blessing, and his security. You know, Satan and the world and and our old flesh conspire together against us to say, you know, do what you want. Do what feels good. Do what your friends are doing. Do do what, uh, you know, the movies tell you to do or popular songs. And, And there's this sense that we think that's the way we have to go because that's what everyone else is doing. And that just seems normal now. But it isn't. It often causes heartache and anxiety and frustration. And there's more people going to counseling than ever today with less and less people finding satisfaction. It's because we've departed from the plan. We've rejected our king. The, the one that has all the wisdom, we've said, no, that's okay. We might not be like the ones described here. We're not maybe conspiring. We're not plotting against God. We're just ignoring him. We're just rejecting his rule in our life. We're just kind of following our own path in our own way. Isn't that kind of what we think of as the American way, that we have all this freedom to do whatever we want? I don't think that's the point of our freedom. It isn't to freedom to destroy ourselves, to hurt each other, to ruin relationships, to, to completely find ourselves at odds with God's plan. Well, in verses 4 to 9, God responds to man's rebellion. It says, The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. This isn't a picture of God that we normally think about today. It's it's no wonder that this psalm isn't preached very much. It kind of doesn't fit along with the feel-good message that a lot of churches feel like they, they have to constantly present. But I don't know how we can feel good if we have a wrong view of God. We, we can pretend that everything's okay, that whatever we do is all right, that God just kind of winks and says it's okay, but God knows what's best for us. And, and he knows part of that is following his rule in our lives. In this particular instance, uh, this psalm was often used, uh, I said it was a royal psalm, it was used when they inaugurated a new king. And, and so whether it was King David or or Solomon, or some of the others to follow. This was a psalm that they sung at his inauguration. And so as they thought about their place in the world with all these other nations in opposition, it encouraged them to realize that they were on the side of God, that he had chose Israel as his people. And as this rebellion was going on against God and against his king, God's response is interesting, not one that we normally think about is from God. It says, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. He scoffs at them. And the word I used here was God responds to man's rebellion with derision. We don't use that word derision much. It means to ridicule or to laugh at with scorn. Um, this is probably a terrible illustration, but... Um, Every once in a while on Facebook or YouTube or something, you'll see a a camp that a basketball player is doing. And I can't remember who it was I saw recently, but it was a big guy, you know, he's like six foot ten. And he has like a five-year-old that he's playing one-on-one basketball with. And, And, you know, if it was one of us, my guess is we'd probably let the kid score, we'd encourage him, you know, we'd tell him, you're doing fine. 
But this one is so funny. The little five-year-old comes up to drive against the hoop, and the guy just swats the ball and laughs. That's a little bit of the picture I get here. It's not even really a good comparison. But it's that idea that you guys, you puny human beings, are trying to rebel against me, God? I laugh at that. That, that makes me laugh. That's, that, that's just something that I'm not threatened. I'm not worried about it. Uh, I'm not sweating it out. I'm, I'm not, you know, having a hard time sleeping. I laugh at that because... Your small power is nothing in comparison to the power of the Almighty God. He doesn't worry. He laughs at their plots because God knows he alone is in control. Listen to what the most powerful king in his day said in Daniel 4. This is King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. It says, At the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to the heaven, and my sanity returned to me. Then I praised the Most High and honored and glorified him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of earth are counted as nothing. And he does what he wants with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. There is no one who can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? In the early days of the church, there was a Roman emperor named Diocletian. And Diocletian kind of had an ego, because like most Roman emperors, he... He thought of himself as God, and he had the people worship him. And so he wasn't very happy with the Christians who wouldn't worship him. And so Diocletian had a medal created with the inscription, the name of Christians being extinguished. And then later, he had a pillar in Spain erected on which was written, Diocletian, for having abolished the superstition of Christ, for having extended the worship of the gods. Most of us never even heard of Diocletian. You, you think God was threatened by Diocletian's statements? By that little metal that he had inscribed or that pillar that he made? I mean, probably most of us have never seen it or heard of it. Probably never even heard of Diocletian. I'm, I think I maybe heard of him one time a long time ago in one of my church history classes. God's not worried about Diocletian. God's not worried about ISIS. He's not worried about Russia or North Korea, and he wasn't worried about Babylon or Rome or Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. I was uh, one of those children that had the unfortunate, uh, um, I don't know if I I would say opportunity or what, but living during the time of the Cold War where there was always this fear about nuclear war. I, I know some of you are my age and you probably remember that. I remember in school having duck and cover drills where you go under the desk and cover your head. I remember hearing about people having bomb shelters. My brother, who was 11 years older than me, he liked to scare us, and he told us that um, if the Russians push that button, we have like 90 seconds to live. Great thing to tell your five-year-old brother. <laughs> and we, we were in fear all the time of nuclear war or something like that happening. And I think today there is... A little bit of that, nothing like it was in the 60s. And God wasn't worried back then. And he's not worried now. Because God has a plan. He has a plan to rule through his anointed one. In verses 7 to 9, it kind of changes a little bit of the tone. And it talks about not so much God's reaction in his laughing and derision over these plots against him. But now it talks more about his plan. That he says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. He plans to rule through his anointed one. Again, where we get the term Messiah or Christ and referring to an Old Testament anointed official, a prophet, a priest, or in this case, a king. And this is fulfilled. In the Old Testament, the, the kings that were in David's royal line ruled in Zion. And the ultimate fulfillment will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ when he rules in his kingdom on this earth after his second coming in Jerusalem. And this section refers to the covenant. There's a lot of theological debate about 
what's being said in verse 7 about you are my son, today I have become your father. Well, the first fulfillment of that is it's talking about the covenant that God made with David. Where he said, you're my son, and those in your line are going to be as sons to me. And then the ultimate fulfillment is in Jesus Christ. Where it says, today I've begotten you. It's a, it's a metaphor. Again, psalms are, are songs. They're, they're lyrics. And it refers to the time of his coronation as king and the father-son relationship with God. So God says, see all the turmoil, all the rebellion, all the conflict, all the wars, all this stuff going on against me. First of all, he says, I don't worry about it. I laugh at it. And then secondly, it's because I have a plan. That not only am I ruling in the heavens, but I'm going to rule on the earth. And the immediate fulfillment was through Israel, through the kings, through, through David and his sons. But ultimately it would be when Jesus returns. That then everything will be once again under his control. Not just in heaven, but on earth. It will be fulfilled literally when Jesus comes back to reign. And in verse 9, it's interesting, the terminology there. It says, you'll rule them with an iron scepter. You'll dash them to pieces like pottery. I did a study on that, and I thought, what is this whole thing about the the breaking them to pieces like pottery? Well, I guess that was a, a symbol that the Egyptian kings and pharaohs used to demonstrate their power. They would have these clay pots, and they would represent different nations in the world, and they would take their scepter, and they would smash them in their courts, to show their power, to demonstrate their authority over these other kingdoms and these other nations. And so God is using that that metaphor, that picture, to say, ultimately, Jesus will reign. He'll squash this rebellion. Satan will be defeated. And this is fulfilled when Jesus returns. Listen to Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. I saw heaven standing open, And there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations." He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you're one that frets today over evil seeming to win, if you look around and you see things that are unjust and you get frustrated about it, or you see God's name being drugged through the mud and you get discouraged, you got to look ahead. God's got this under control. He's not sweating it. He's not worried. He has a plan. He knows the last chapter of the story because he's writing the story. Good will win. Jesus will reign. Evil will be destroyed. We can rest in him. We can wait on him. The application point here is despite opposition and rebellion, God is still in control. God's absolutely sovereign. He's in control. We don't live in what some uh, religions believe is a dualistic universe. I don't know if you've heard of that before. Dualism is the idea that there are two equal powers. That there's yin and yang and there's... There's good and evil, that there's Satan and God, and they're all equal, and they're just always battling, and we don't know what the outcome's going to be. That's not the world that we live in. We live in a world where there is one that's in control. There's enemies. There's opposition. There, there's rebellion, but there's one that is ultimately in control. There's no karma. There's no fate. There's no bad juju. It's all about God being in control. There is opposition. There are our opponents. There is rebellion. But God's greater than any enemy. God's greater than any force that would come against us. So the good news is we, we don't have to lose sleep over it. God isn't. He knows what's going to happen. 
He's got this. He can handle it. And so whatever comes into your life, we need that understanding of this is our God. Not a puny God that we kind of hope will work things out, but a God that we know is in control. He's got his handle on it, whether it's life or death, whether it's the economy, the election, your job, your health, your retirement, your kids, your grandkids, the future. God's in control. And Jesus is in the center of God's plan for the world and for our lives. He's God's anointed one. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. And all of God's plans center around him. The great news is we're invited to join with him. We're invited to be part of this work. We're we're invited to be part of his mission in this world. And then the last stanza of this psalm, God invites us to submit to his rule through his son. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. He gives a warning to those who would oppose God's anointed. And it doesn't just apply to kings, rulers, uh, presidents, prime ministers, but to all of us. Because in a sense, we're all little, small L lords of our lives. That we make decisions and we decide who we're going to submit to. God says, be warned. There is one who's in charge. And an appeal is made to serve the Lord. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. The same Jesus, the same Jesus who's our Savior, the same Jesus who's the one who went to the cross for us is the Lord. He's the King. He's the judge who will reign in the future with or without our willingness. Philippians 2, 9 to 11 is prophetic in that it says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, And gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. He's not just our Savior. He's not just our magic genie that answers our prayer if we say it right. He's our King. He's our Lord. He's the sovereign Master, and He calls us to submit to His rule in our lives. And then in verse 12, he talks about judgment. Judgment will come on those who reject him. Kiss the son is, a, is an expression of, of how you respond to royalty. You've probably heard of people kissing the Pope's ring or bowing before the king. It's a, it's a picture of submission to the king. The idea here is that we don't need to run from God. We can run to him. There's no refuge from God. There's only refuge in God. I want to close with an interesting story that I read this week. It said a woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shops, shops, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to sit down. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man sitting beside her, as bold as he could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag in between in which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. So she munched the cookies and watched the clock, as this gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I would blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. When only one was left, she wondered what he would do. With a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother, This guy has some nerve, and he's also rude. Why, he didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate, refusing to look back at the thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane, sank in her seat, then she sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. If mine are here, she moaned in despair, the others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief. I think we'd all agree that the woman is right 
to realize that she's the wrong one. That it's kind of like those that rage and plot against God. They think they're justified. They think that they have a chance against him. They think they're better off without him. However, they're dead wrong. What sometimes appears to us like a blocked goal, like God opposing us, is God being generous, saying, I want to offer you something better. I I, I want to keep you from going down the wrong path. I want to spare you the heartache that you're following after. And so many, many, many times what we see as something that's bad news, something that's hard or hurtful or severe, is God's mercy. It's his grace. And today we're going to celebrate communion because it's a reminder that God's plan is the right way and that it's centered around his son, Jesus Christ. And that the solution to the world's problems today begins with individual people getting right with him. So as we think about the elements of the Lord's table, it reminds us that it's not about a plan or a a list of moral obligations, a religious system, It's about a person, about the Christ, about Jesus, God's Son. And because he's a person, he appeals to us on a personal level. You must personally put your faith faith in him. It's not your parents' faith. It's not your spouse's faith. It's not your friend's faith. None of those things can open the door for you. It's your faith. It's your willingness to personally put your trust in him. And communion is an acknowledgement of that faith in Jesus Christ and remembering what he did for you. I'm going to have the praise team come up and share a song with us as we think about these things and prepare our hearts for the Lord's table today.